Here's your table. We're ready to war game. We have set the edges of our conflict to the edge of the table. But did you ever stop to think about the rest of the world? Today, we're going to talk about the rest of the world. And we're going to talk about that ephemeral boundary between in-game and out-of-game. The question, have you thought about the rest of the world, is a little bit rhetorical, isn't it? We always think about the rest of the world. Every scenario that you come up with is a scenario that assumes or tells the story about the rest of the world and how our terrain gets where it is, how our figures get onto the board before the game or perhaps come onto the board during the game all plays a role in breaking that ephemeral boundary between in-game and out-of-game. Many cases, the simplest thing to do... Well, let's start with an example here. Gaslands is probably one of the simplest ways to get from out-of-game to in-game. It's a race car game. And so in this game, you have a starting line. And your cars line up in some particular order. But whatever came before isn't really all that relevant. Because everything that's outside of the world is largely irrelevant. You've got a racetrack, you've got boundaries, you're done. But in a game like One Hour War Games, you've got a collection of 30 different scenarios. And the deployment is where you begin to see how the outside world affects the inside world. And in fact, in a campaign, that is integral to the game, breaching the boundary between out of and inside the game. In a normal narrative campaign, you will just play out the scenario and you will post facto rationalize the decision making process. But in many games, that decision making process is actually the way that you model that outside of the game conflict and how that breaches this boundary to give you the conflict within the game. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Those of you that have been around for a while will recognize this particular map. This is a map-based campaign game where we generated armed forces in two matched countries and the forces spawned in towns. We had to run through the math and the numbers, figure out how long it took for different forces to move different distances and figure out where those battles were most likely to be. The terrain dictated where we went and then once we actually had our forces matched, now all of this was only to generate the rosters and to give us some general guidelines as to who's coming from which direction. But once we got down to a particular battle, we just went back to the purely random. Our generals had very little say over what terrain was present. In this case, the Battle of Dakisville, we had a hill, a couple of roads, a river, heavy woods, another hill up here, and another road, and oh, this river, if I recall correctly, we randomized, and it was very difficult to cross. This randomness didn't really owe all that much to this rest of the world, with the exception, and here's Dackeysville here, there is an east-west road, and look, we stipulated, because we have an east-west road, there has to be an east-west road. For whatever reason, it follows a bit of an odd contour here, but the people that live here, you know, they determine where that is. The dice determine where that is. So aside from this little bit of influence on the match forces, this process of determining the terrain was wholly separated from this larger outside world. We largely used the outside world to determine our rosters and our force selection. Once we got to this point, we had almost free reign to determine where our forces came in on, uh, which side they came in on. We knew that one force was coming largely from the east and one largely from the west, but we allotted some freedom of movement for the jockeying of these armies to maybe approach from a more northerly or southerly. Of course, they're going to come at each other along a front roughly 180 degrees. Very seldom did armies line up and come at each other at 90 degrees. The way that just, I'm not going to belabor the point, you guys understand that armies generally get fed in and you're trying to protect your flanks. So you're not going to expose one flank to the major power of your, your enemies. At any rate, that's one way to do it. That's one way to bridge that gap. And this kind of map-based campaign makes the decision-making process here 
influence this process here. But what do you do in a case of a game where you don't have that kind of global perspective? Well, there's a lot of different things. I want to take a look at a couple of them because every game that you play will model that global perspective. Here in Planet 28, you will... Oh, I thought I hear... Yeah, so once you've got your guys set up, deployment is the phase where you model that. And in the case of Planet 28, you number the sides of the board, one through four, and then you roll a d6. And on a five, one through four, you set up on that side. On a five, you set up in the middle. And in a six, you get to choose whatever you want. So this is another case where the dice completely randomly determine where you set up. The outside world has a little effect, and you, as the wargamer, are left to create that post-facto rationalization. Why are my guys in the center? That may depend on the plot point that they give you for that as well. But again, that's a very crude model. And once the game begins, that line is a hard distinction. Once you leave the conflict area, you're out of the game because you're out of the battle. And again, a lot of this depends on the scenario. We saw this in Neil Thomas's One Hour War Games. Flipping to a random scenario, disordered defense. He gives you the situation here. The outside world is that the Blue Army has launched a surprise attack trying to capture this crossroads. The Red Army is unprepared. So the deployment becomes the Red Army gets one unit in each of these zones facing south and one unit at the crossroads, where the Blue Army brings four units up this way, and then there are some reinforcements coming in as Blue gets their act together. Hey, that's an outside world. It's all stipulated for you. You don't have a whole lot of say. Although, that said, at least you get the freedom to put whichever units... You're going to be handed four units. Which ones do you want here, and which ones do you want coming in? So there's that little bit of generalship that you exercise prior to turn one beginning proper then you have a situation like on guard and in the case of on guard it's very simple let's let's actually set these aside for the moment because we can look at the most common forms of deployment and we're going to use red forces and blue forces and this is where the modeling comes in handy so you have determined that red and blue are going to come on now there's a couple of ways to do this you roll to determine We'll get to you later, Song. So, however you do it, you decide who's got the initiative. And one team gets to pick which side they're coming in. You may also have a situation where the defender is setting up all of the terrain, and then the attacker gets to decide what direction he attacks from, with the defender left to defend one of, those four, one of the other four sides. That creates a bit of generalship where the blue has to set up defensible terrain, but it has to be defensible from all four directions. If he sets it up to be extremely defensible here and weak here, well, the attackers are going to come in from there. So the defender, it behooves him to create a very fair and balanced table so that whatever side the attacker comes in on, the attacker won't have the advantage. In a, very, in a game where the, the players alternate, Perhaps they roll, and then it may be the case that our attacker deploys all of his units. Now, he'll have strong units, fast units, standard units, and he'll get some latitude to put strong versus fast where he wants, but he has to bear in mind that in a game of rock, paper, scissors, his opponent can then put his fast opposite the strong or his line units opposite the strong. Now you've got some tactical decisions that are made before a single unit has moved a single step. This is how you model the rest of the world and how the rest of the world drives the action on the table. Another way to do it is for players to alternate. The defender puts a, a force on table, and depending on where his deployment zone is, it may be in the center. Then the attacker places a unit. Ah, now what the attacker... Or, excuse me, the defender has to decide, well, am I going to go strong opposite that? And if he goes strong, maybe he'll want to put, so there's a back and forth that's, a, that's engaged here where the two players are already, this is the strategic level game that's impacting the tactical level game. But we're still just looking at this, and that's a, that's a way of modeling how the outside world impacts the inside of the game, and that's how many of the the scenarios inside 
Song of Blades and Heroes work. Now, there may be a very narrative. Let's take a look at another game here real quick. Tomorrow's War. And I've bookmarked one of the scenarios from this. This map, uh, it's as hard to read in person as it is here on the, on the screen. But, up oh, there we go. So, in this scenario, you've got a colony of survive of... It's basically alien. And you've got a colony with civilians. And you've got a red lab full of xenomorphs who are trying to eat the people. Player Blue is trying to get the people off to the starport. Nothing around this side matters. All that matters is the starport is over here. This is another case where the outside world doesn't really have a whole lot of influence. If you move off, you're assumed lost. And then C is the, the um, reinforcement point for the military forces that are coming to rescue the colonists. Notice that it's distal from the aliens. So the colonists, given this scenario, have to decide, am I going to take the fast route down the road, which is also fast for them? Or am I going to try to sneak through the woods? How are these guys going to move up? Because the aliens in this game come out in bits and pieces. It's not one giant wave. Do they seize the crossroads? Do they take cover? Right. So you've got some tactical decisions. But again, the only real off-board points of interest are this is where they come from. This is where they go. So fairly self-contained. Not all of the scenarios in this book are like this. There's another scenario a few pages later. Let's see if I can find it. Where you've got multiple points on the board where reinforcements enter. There are a few light forces enter on the board. And a few, and then you've got a resource, uh, uh, excuse me, a reinforcement point, And a few of the blue forces as well. They are assumed to have already seized these buildings. This is the uh, CCP. They've already got a tank up holding the crossroads. The reinforcements come on in these points. So again, kind of self-contained. It's not a campaign. It's just a simple one-off. But the, these points are driven by outside the world. One other very clever... I lost my original copy, AK-47 Republic... AK-47 Republic is an, is an interesting one because it, is, it has a whole narrative pre-game. Once you've built your army, there's a very good chance that you will have units that are simply not available based on a flowchart that you run down. Why are they not available? If we pick one at random, this is a religious movement. Uh, the religious leader is appointed to military rank and power. Uh, so you... You have to spend money, you roll a d6, and it's a bad idea. The religious leader is terrible. And in that case, minus three movement dice for the whole game for one of the units. One of the units, his morale is shattered because you appointed the wrong religious guy. On the other hand, there's a good chance that this one unit is willing to martyr themselves. And so their morale goes through the roof. This is a bit of a mini-game that mimics the kind of 1980s conflict for warlord level battles in Africa. And so depending on your force structure, if you are uh, a people's popular front, you're largely militia, you'll have different power-ups and, and degradations to your forces. Likewise, if you are a client state and you've got the superpower backing, there's a good chance you'll be gifted a lot of freebies. There's also a good chance that the people around you will hate your guts because you're working for the foreign for an infidels. At any rate, that's a bit of a pregame that handles the political situation off the board. Fascinating exercise. Once you actually set the units up on the table, you are almost guaranteed to have one, the, you've got five or six units. And you roll a d6, and on a two through six, the first unit will come on. And then you say, okay, this is my second one. He only comes on on a three through six. Third one comes on on a four through six, and so on. So you pick your the one you want the most has the most chance of coming on, you designate him first. So he's almost guaranteed to come on. That sends a signal to your opponent who you want to come on. That mimics logistics and supply chain problems and movement problems. Maybe there's a, you know, there's a lot of ways to rationalize this. Maybe there's a bridge out somewhere. Maybe you're dealing with a lieutenant that can't read a map. What are the odds of that happening, right? Uh, so, once you've got your units, anybody that didn't come on, doesn't start the game on the board, can come on as reinforcements. You set up the defender first, and then the defender can set up pretty much anywhere on the table, outside of six inches from the attacker's side. 
Uh, by this time, the players will both know where the objectives are. Uh, the attacker sets up his units within six inches of his start edge, so he gets you know that small rectangle that he can set up in. So the defender has to go first, and again, you've got that game where the defender is trying to cover all the avenues of attack because if he misses one, that's where the attacker is going to set up. So another interesting deployment, another interesting way of bridging that gap. This is another way of doing it, and this is something that I'd love to, to experiment with. It's essentially a grand tactical version of the campaign that we started looking at. It's this kind of campaign done on a more localized scale. Remember I, I said that this map here, this is our Bellum Munda, no, that's not it. You guys have been very inspirational. I've been doing a lot of war games. Come on, just give me one of the maps. There you go. So there's Dextromania and Sinistrea. We need to get back to this at some point. This is to, this is a nationwide scale. This is more of a county-wide scale. And what I've done is, just for the purposes of illustration, I've generated this simple map. There's a few hills in the center. The brown are roads. The little dots here are towns. You can see there's a ridge here, and all the little green are forests. And you may have one army that comes on, and you can set up a scenario. The red army wants to seize this vital crossroads. That's what they're trying to do, and they've got two units. Blue has two units, one of which starts in this crossroads, and one is going to come on later to defend. Well, I should bring him in over here. So now you have a tactical decision where you're moving pieces around the board until they get close enough to actually have a fight. Maybe he starts there. And so red has a, to make that choice. Do I want to go full at the army or am I going to march straight on for my final goal? When they get, Or maybe he decides, you know what, I am going to come on over here and I'm going to march cross country. So that when he comes to battle, he's going to have to attack me to stop me from sneaking around the flank. Either way, as you move these pieces around the board, sooner or later they're going to get close enough. Now, you can set the scale for this so that this little template here is, assuming you have a 3 foot by 5 foot table, this is 3 foot by 5 foot on the map will correspond directly to the three foot by five foot on your table. So everything inside the rectangle now, when these guys get close enough to be on a table, depending on where they're at, oh, as soon as they get this, call it five inches away, hey, now we know where those guys are coming on the board. You set your terrain based on where this template is. In this case, you've got a city at either side of the table, Red coming in from the west, blue from the east, and there's one hill on this side and a couple of roads, crossroads, and one little woods here. So it's going to be very defensible for blue. Well, maybe red came along this way, and this is what your table's going to look like. Or you may even set up a scenario like this where blue is trying to stop red from crossing the board. See, so now... What this does is it allows the rest of the world to exist independent of your table. Or no, excuse me. Your table, I should reverse that. Your table is dependent on the rest of the world. And instead of the, in this case, the rest of the world is largely dictating broad stroke terrain and force composition, you've already got the force composition set up and the rest of the world is, you can think of it as micromanaging the terrain set up on your board. And what if we each have four pieces? And now you have to decide, well, hey, maybe you've got four pieces and you have to choose whether you want to keep all four of them in one place and defeat your opponent piecemeal. In which case, you may encounter a running series of battles. Four strength points versus two in the first battle over here. And this guy has decided, well, I'm going to throw him at you in a couple of different ways. Well, that's in one guy up here. I'm going to try to beat these guys. I'm going to try to slow them down here. And then once this battle is over, hopefully that ends in time that I can actually bring reinforcements down to fight this battle to where... Here's our terrain, right? A couple of cities on the, on the left side of the table. 
couple of roads as shown here, one hill and scattered trees all around. And now you may run into a situation where you're facing three on two with the potential for reinforcements to come in from behind and cut off their retreat. Much more complicated way of doing things and a much more interesting way of running a campaign than a simple series of vaguely connected battles. But there's one other thing I want you to think about as you play these games, because I don't see a lot of games dealing with this issue. We're going to go back to here's our tabletop, and here's our, our, our forces are fighting. They're lined up, and they're ready to charge at each other. Now that we've started the game, the rest of the world falls away. We're, we're on an island here, and everything outside of the island phew, doesn't really matter. Or does it? And this is one of the reasons I finally decided to put this video together. This is a game called Chosen Men. It's by Mark Latham. And I haven't even finished reading it yet, but it has a very interesting concept in it. To put you in the right frame of mind, this is for skirmish games, large skirmish games. You're going to probably have 30 to 50 guys each. The, the forces that you're selecting from in this game are largely light units. 10 infantrymen, 5 cavalry. You're not looking at big battalions in this case. You're looking at the kind of conflicts that would happen where one force is trying to seize a bridge and, and he sent his fast movers up as, as, as quickly as possible. And the only guys, you know, the stragglers who were closest to the bridge, they can get there, maybe 20 infantry. And then the, 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 the most rested cavalry. So you've got three units, maybe three units of two units of line, one unit of hussars, and one unit of light infantry on one side, and on the other side, three cavalry and one, I don't know, voltigeurs, right? They're fighting over a bridge. Or you you are going to model a a resupply. You've got foragers that are out, and you're fighting over a single farm. At any rate, you're looking at around fifty guys per side. You know, more or less, depending on how many cavalry you have involved. That's the scale of skirmish we're looking at. Or perhaps this battle right here is the battle for a key farmhouse. And there's a huge battle raging on either side. You know, red's over here, blue's over here. But this one key point, that the, the hinge, the fulcrum for the battle, that's what we're going to zoom in on. But the fact that we're fighting over this doesn't mean that the guys around here are just sitting around waiting. We ran into this problem when we played through the Battle of Cholet. Let me refresh your memory for this particular battle. This was part of the Wars of the French... Oh, I'm looking at War Game Soldiers and Strategy, by the way, here. Uh, this is part of the Wars of um, the French Revolution. And we played a series of three battles. Here's the map that we used. Left, right, and center. Left, right, and center. And then we played a fourth battle taking the survivors of the left, right, and center. And that fourth battle depended on them. Well, we ran into an issue where as we were fighting this battle over here on the left flank, the Republican left, we had the question of how secure is our flank? We kind of ignored it. We punted because we hadn't played this center battle yet. Likewise, when we played this left one, we said, well, what's going on over there? I think actually when we played the, the excuse me, when we played the right one, we knew that the center was, was not great for the, Von, the Vondeans. And we just kind of hand-waved away, and it was a little bit unsatisfying. Well, that's where we turn our attention back to Chosen Men because the, the one of the few, oh, this, well, hang on. This is something you don't see very often. It's got a feature called, and I want to quote, like I said, I haven't read this. It's uh, Cauldron of War Strategies. And this is what you roll. So after you set up the, the battlefield and the terrain, you roll a d6. And let me give you an example of what might happen here. As your units are racing around the battlefield, you might find that a unit from off table. So these guys are trying to sneak around. Hey, there's a unit over here of red that opens fire on them. Maybe these guys are pushing back and oh, 
maybe there's a unit of artillery back here that stops to lob a few shells into the battlefield. In some cases, I think it's the French, they actually get to choose one of those. You may have a situation where you tell one of your opponents, hey, remove a, this unit. And now when the battle starts, he's going to be badly outnumbered. It's a point-based system. Maybe it's a 300 versus 300. Well, call it 400 versus 400. And I say, hey, you know what? He doesn't start on the battle. He doesn't come on until turn two. Ha ha. Now I have a four to three advantage over you. Except I better hurry because on turn two, he can come in over here. And now all I've done is expose my flank. But maybe, right? So this is one of the ways that you can mimic the outside battle. But it's not just at the start of the game. It's not just a deployment. It is an ongoing situation that can affect this key point of the battlefield right here. There's one other example I want to give you of how you can model the rest of the world, and it's one of my favorites. There have been a few, and I think it's Warhammer 40k. Uh, game days, uh, I, there was one at a local club where you had six tables that were all playing their games simultaneously. No one moved on to the second half of turn one, and it's an I go, you go system. So all of the guys on one side would go in the first half of the first turn, and then all the guys on the other side would go in the second half. And no one would start turn two until all six tables had finished turn one. And that was important because one of these tables had artillery. And whoever controlled the artillery at the end of the turn could fire for effect on other tables during that same game. Likewise, there was one table where the attackers were trying to cross, it wouldn't be lengthwise, it would be short, shortwise, was trying to cross the table. And if he could get a unit off this table, that unit could appear on one of four other tables. So it was a delaying action. And in fact, in this particular instance, you had a small defensive force that had to pick and choose who it was going to stop. It couldn't stop everybody. So it had to pick and choose who it was going to stop from crossing the table. And... In point of fact, not only that, but because there were, call it, four jump gates to the other tables, they could pick and choose which table they could direct those forces that were leaving onto another table. Does that make sense? So if, if, if there's a really good fight going on for the artillery and side A does not want B to have it, then side A could dump all of its defenses here to make sure that side B didn't get any reinforcements on that table. This is a very clever way. It's a very big way. You're going to need at least, in this case, 12 players and possibly more if you're dealing with three players on a side. But this is another great way that your individual table is part of a larger... It is a small slice of a larger pie. And sometimes I think we get so drawn into the minutia, the, the one guy shooting at one guy and... And, oh, is this guy, do, do we have enough guys? Is this more than half in the woods? And, you know, we're so dialed into this that we don't tend to think about the rest of this. And perhaps it's just because, having just read a couple of great books by luminaries, Donald Featherstone and Tony Bath, about how to set up a wargaming campaign, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this, about this boundary between the game board itself and the rest of the world and how you know, and how the rest of the world feeds into this and how our overly simplistic model, well, I guess this is my side, I guess this is your side, is way too simplistic. Hey, two by two Napoleonics, that's the other one uh, that we play frequently on this table where you have, you set your forces up here and you set your forces up here. And then this guy sets up a reinforcement point. And this guy can, and the attacker, red is the attacker. He can set up a reinforcement point on the flanks if he wants to. Coming in on the flanks is harder. You're less likely to get your troops. That's another model. But in this case, that reinforcement point, he has to decide who's coming on in what order. So now you're thinking like a general from the strategic. And, and that 2x2 two two Napoleonics, I think one of the reasons I love it is not so much for what's going on on the board as it is this mini game that allows you to exert some generalship over the larger conflict before you even roll for initiative. A lot of ideas here. A lot of things for you to think about in your own games. If you're thinking about designing your own game or you're thinking about tinkering with existing rules to make a game your own, give some thought.
to this ephemeral boundary and how you're going to model the way the larger world affects your table. Just some thoughts. I'm praying for you.